everyone, and a warm welcome to you. My name is Maria Trenvalli, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. We will open up for live Q&A at the end of this event, so please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout this presentation. And none of what we do would be possible without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, BPM, NZTE, and Microsoft for Startups. We are humbled by their contribution. During these unique times, we are curious about how you are feeling and sentiment among the entrepreneurs that we work with. I would love to start by taking two different polls. Poll number one, I'll launch that now. How are you currently feeling? Are you feeling fearful, anxious? Are you surviving or feeling optimistic? Let us know in the poll here. Thank you all so much for submitting your answers. I'll end the poll and share those results. It looks like a lot of us are feeling like we're surviving right now with a follow-up of optimistic. So hopefully this webinar with Paul will help you feel less like you are currently surviving. Another question that we have for you, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance, sales? Is it marketing, scaling, pivoting your team or surviving? Let us know here and we can use this information to make sure that we are offering you programming that meets your current needs. Thank you all so much. I'll end that poll now and share out those results. It looks like sales is what is keeping us up at night the most alongside finance. Well, it looks like y'all are in the right place. Stopping that share now. Well, again, so grateful for you all being here today. And without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our special guest, Paul DeSouza. Paul has spent his career helping companies increase revenue, his approach to strategic and mapped to the business goals of leadership team. Paul has been turning businesses around and helping design sales strategies since 2003. And before that, Paul was an account executive selling multi-million dollar enterprise software and IT services in projects within Fortune 500 companies and market spaces. Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. So it's so happy to be here. Uh, I love the programs you are doing, the programming that you're doing and the wonderful service you're offering people. So uh, is this my cue to... Uh, Yes. to share my screen and launch. It is, Paul. Please take it away from here. Thank you again. Yeah, most welcome. Let me stand by. Let me see if I know I can figure out what I am doing. I share screen. And presentation. Is that good? That looks fantastic, Paul. We're so ready for your presentation. OK. So good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. For me, it's actually afternoon. I'm calling, I'm speaking in and uh, tuning in from the Navajo Nation in New Mexico. I really am enjoying doing this. I love what I do and uh, so happy to share with you these ideas and thoughts. And actually what I'm gonna do is just so that you understand is I'm gonna really have a conversation with you. I do have a maybe 30 slides, they're talking points. And I'd like for you to really get a sense of, you know, your story, your narrative, right? Your life. What do you want to get out of our session today? Uh, we will have questions and answers, but this is more about a, a dialogue, right? A mastermind, if you would, where, you know, we'll come together and as a group, we'll support each other. So thoughts and ideas that you have uh, with relationship to your business, context is everything. So with all the information I give you, ask yourself, what do you want to get out of today? And let's operationalize it, right? Let's make it practical. What needs to happen for you to increase revenue in 45 days? Is that possible, right? 
And if so, what's that? What's the trajectory? Uh, think in those terms, context again, focus, 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 focus. So once, if you hold that filter and then listen to what I'm saying, you'll have a greater chance of everything being more operational, right? Uh, I have a lot of polysms. And one of the polysms uh, uh, is that, hey, in a down market, you still have a market, right? And the question to you is, have you found yours? Have you found your place in the sun today? We're not going back to, to 2019, right? The question is, it's a beautiful new market. It's very challenging, but a lot of huge opportunities. This is a list of just some of the opportunities I'm dealing with. Literally every one of these topics, I know companies, I'm talking to people, I'm solving problems, I'm helping them increase revenue and or we're doing M&A work, you know, with acquisitions and with my private equity uh, companies. IoT security, healthcare for obvious reasons, video streaming technology, business IT, huge changes over here because even the small businesses have to be structured to win in this marketplace. You have employees going working from home. You have customers not wanting to come into your store, into your workplace of business, but they need access to that data, as an example. Security is a risk, app, applications that we talk to each other. So huge opportunities there, right? Uh, I'm bringing in e-bikes from Thailand to India, uh, from Shenzhen, China to the US, a beautiful company out of three different e-bike companies, rocking it out. Got an Israeli home fitness company I'm working with, helping them with logistics, right? Restaurants, everybody's saying, hey, restaurants, you know, it's a terrible time. To the contrary, one of my friends uh, started, just got into a new restaurant in, in Australia. A friend in Santa Cruz, California is rocking it out, right? Fundamental business need is that people have to eat, Right? Alcohol sales through my m and work with the private equity company, we were buying uh, dis, uh, breweries and distilleries. Why? Because the on-site restaurant sales is down, but the in-home sales are up, as an example. Real estate, huge changes. I was talking to, uh, from LinkedIn, somebody reached out to me, Cole, and said, hey, I'm, and I think it's called Puha, I don't know how you pronounce that. It's two hours east of Seattle. And uh, he's, his business is booming because now folks from uh, Microsoft and Seattle and those kinds of areas, Redmond and uh, Redmond, I think it's called, are leaving, right? So they're going from two and a half million dollar condos and buying 800 and 700 and 600 thousand dollar houses. Huge change, huge opportunities for growth. The exodus is happening. Uh, home gardening equipment. I've got somebody who sold 17,000 units of a home it's a small grow system for herbs in the kitchen on, on Kickstarter, 17,000 units three, four months ago. And I'm trying to bring it out of it. It's being manufactured in India, right? Because uh, one of my, two of my clients are in the logistics space. Uh, but anyways, pets, all these huge opportunities. Question is, have you found yours, right? Kaito is the restaurant I was talking about, just one of the success stories. Uh, in Capitola, good, good friends of mine. We used to spend Thanksgiving every year, but not this year. And that's why I was calling to, to check in with him. And he said, oh, no, business is rocking. It's not the same business. But he used to always say, I'm in the business of serving happiness. And his customers have not forgotten him. He's built private personal relationships of trust with his customers. So now they're grabbing and going. Yeah, he's doing you know Uber Eats and all that, but it's, he has a relationship with his customers on an ongoing basis, and he's still serving happiness one dish at a time. He literally tell you that, right? Uh, again, it's 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 uh, changing times. You have to do business differently, but you know business is service, right? Business is service, and it's all personal. I get excited. I mean, you know, Maria here, when she asked me to come and speak, I was like, boop, just bursting out of the seams, you know, getting, you know, I, I get a little emotional and I, I'm passionate. I, I want to help people. And I'll go with this. My brand is simply this one sentence. I help people find their joy. For me, it's all about the joy, right? A transaction, what's a close? Right. I heard years ago, I had a, a teacher tell me, I mean, a, a sales manager, by the way, I started selling chicken seafood and steaks out of a truck in the hills of Kentucky. 
I was in a for sales job after having a master's in social work. And I was a political lobbyist before that. But social work, sales, same thing. You do an intake, you find out what the problem is and you give them a solution, right? Uh, but one of my managers uh, was basically saying, hey, uh, don't trust salespeople. I mean, customers, their buyers are liars. And it, I'm like, no, that is not the case. And then you see Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross, right? There's old movies and they say, always be closing. No, 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 no. Always be caring. This is evolution at play. It's all personal. Every deal impacts somebody. You know, Simon Sinek did great work around knowing your why. And this is more and more relevant today, even in sales, even in B2B sales. Everybody wants to know who you are. They want to know what you stand for. My why is simply I help people find their joy. How do I do this? By helping them link their business strategy with their personal dreams and aspirations, right? So the business strategy and the personal strategy come together, boom, you're in happiness and joy. And what do I do? Speaking engagements, talking to you just like this. I do coaching. I do business strategy consulting. My main offer is a chief revenue officer as a service. And I even designed, made it more, made myself more accessible at the moment by uh, literally designing something that says, pay what you can. <laughs> and if I have the time, I'll help you, right? Uh, what's yours? What is your narrative? What's your why? And, and from an integrity standpoint, is your business strategy linked to your sense of personal uh, strategy or your, your why, but why you exist? When those come together, boom, you'll be happy. You'll be in joy. You'll be making money. You'll be firing all cylinders. You'll have your mojo, whatever that is, right? You'll be on your game. Mindset, and I've got a slide to that. Mindset is, is, is everything. All right. What is your end game? We're all in business, right? The only reason we're in business is so that we can make some money to live a good life. If And I hope your identity is not your business, right? You are a person and then, boom, you're in business so that you can fulfill your life dream. So what is the purpose of your business? And it's a very important question to ask because you treat it differently. The strategies are different, right? Are you here to create value and sell? Or are you here to create value, build a lifestyle and hold so you can take care of yourself and your family consistently through your business? And both are really valid, right? I mean, I lose more uh, M&A deals, mergers, acquisitions, where I'm always looking for companies because I'm in that business. Uh, more than 50% of my work is working with private equity, buying, selling companies, things like that. And I lose more deals in that space because people say, Paul, what would I do even if we sold? right? Or if I sell you my business, what happens to my people and me? Because I really want to make sure that we have a good quality of life, right? And I don't know what else to do. There's no wrong answer. The question is, if you're creating value, you, you hit the accelerators differently, right? The go-to-market strategy is different. The type of deal you sell is different. Uh, but if you're looking to hold, it's very different. And I use that information very seriously when I'm giving people advice or designing strategies for help them uh, increase revenue because all revenue is not the same, okay? Now, once you answer those previous questions, then answer this question. What business are you really in? Like McDonald's, they're not in the food business, right? They're in the real estate business because that's where the value is. So again, I ask you, what business are you really in? And it's, it's not an intuitive answer. I mean, you really have to think about this. Uh, and obviously I can help you with that, but uh, you know, I used to work with Tony Robbins and he used to say, this is the million dollar question, really understanding what business you're in. And I think eight out of nine uh, customers that come to me for my coaching work don't, don't have the right answer on that. Um, but get creative. This is not about what you're selling, but it's about the value. It's more about what, what, revenue, like what are your customers? Why do your customers buy from you? And where do you make the most money, right? Somewhere between both those questions, the answer is, is, the, is the real answer. We'll get to that later. Now, revenue happens, right? Especially in today's COVID marketplace, when you've got a problem that somebody's willing to spend money on with you, right? 
Uh, in the old days, we used to say it's all about transactions. Then we said, no, it's all about providing solutions. And now I say, especially in the COVID world, it's all about solving funded problems, right? Because if without the transaction, you don't have a deal, you don't have business, you have fantasy, right? Uh, and this is true, is helping people find the right solution, both B2B, B2C, as well as if you're working through channels, right? So it'll be B2B to B to C. Uh, and then if you're the core seller, and I work with this a lot, is that you in the B2B to B to C space, you have to make sure that your offering or your product still has value and you probably you have you are very clear about what problems your B2B to B to C customers, right, have that your product or service can solve. So being very aware of that will increase your ability to transact profitably, i.e. revenue and profits. Now, a lot of people really have to focus on the art of the pivot, right? The need to pivot is very, very real today. Uh, for some companies, it's small, it's subtle changes. For other companies, it's very big. And for people, right? I, 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 I know salespeople like in, uh, in the um, alcohol distribution space, for example, that was selling into restaurants, or if you were a salesperson for, you know, the Cisco or somebody that's selling uh, supplies to restaurants, as an example, um, or if you were in the uh, commercial real estate space, you've got to change, you've got to find something else. And sometimes it is shutting one door down and opening another. But you've got to find a solution that people need in today's market. This is key. It's got to be irrelevant. Right, and then you've got to find many customers. So you've got to figure out, hey, not, not what people need. We all live with problems we can't solve, right? The question is, are they willing to spend money to solve it in today's world and how much will they pay? Very, very practical, if you would. So you've got to identify that. That takes creativity, that takes research, that takes insight, that takes wisdom, that takes networking, and then, you know, it's, it's problem, complex problem solving. You got to fulfill on those promises. You got to engage your customers because we live in a very connected world today. It's a huge opportunity. I love the fact that we're connected. I love the fact that our prospects can go research all the competition and then come back. I love that, right? Because that allows you more opportunities for you to engage with your customer, right? And they keep, if you're the one giving them the answers, they'll come back to you. Right? It's, it's a great opportunity for you to build a relationship of trust, which is essential. And I've got a strategy, I'll show you that. Right? Uh, and then once you get customers coming back and you learn how to communicate because they're not going to be in your store, that's why you've got to learn to communicate with them remotely. Right? Uh, and you've got to learn to just beat your drum and don't be shy about it and tell your stories and get your customers to tell, tell your stories. It's called referrals in, right? uh, and testimonials. This is the new way of doing things. Uh, I've got more in a few other slides, but here are the, the top three strategies. I mean, maybe the, not the top three, but really important strategies. You know, we talked about this in the invitation that went out for this event uh, that you really have to wrap your arms around, right? You've got to know what your customers will spend money on. It's all about funded initiatives. You've got to ask people, what will you spend money on? What has been budgeted? What are the top three things uh, well, you know, that your company is going to spend money on in this marketplace in the next 90 days or in Q4 or in Q1 if you're going to stretch out there? Uh, you've got to qualify these opportunities, right? It's time and budget. Do they want the Cadillac version or they want the Pinto version, right? Um, and you've got to understand for them, what is their buying cycle? Remember this word, buying cycle. I've got a slide on this, uh, sales cycle versus buying cycle. And the other thing is in today's world, right, because we're in such a um, relationship-based market where we're all communicating on text and Twitter and this and that, um, everybody that's interacting with the customer on your team, right, uh, is part of the sales team. The old models are all crashed. I wrote about this a year and a half ago, I think on LinkedIn. The new sales ecosystem, right, the new sales team is, is very different to what it was five years ago. So all your customers that have a relationship with your employees are really on the sales team. You know, I was 
selling, uh, I was turning around a printing company uh, in uh, San Mateo a few years ago. Well, wow, 10 years, more than 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, and I had salespeople who used to go to construction sites and meet with the estimators who would place orders for prints. But my drivers that would take these big, you know, blueprints, we used to call them, uh, had a better relationship because they'd be delivering the prints, had a better relationship with the customers that were actually placing orders than my sales guys did wearing you know, suits and ties and sitting in the office. And when the moment, and we were you know, having a beer one day, just, you know, the whole company, we had gone out for burgers and stuff like that on El Camino Real there in San Mateo. And one of these drivers told me the situation, how, oh, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, we know him, we know him, we see him all the time and stuff for like that. And the light bulb went off and I had all my sales guys, three of them, sales guys wear t-shirts and khakis, right, with the company logo, and they would go with the driver and actually deliver the prints and boom, get the next order, right, and build relationships of trust. So my point is, in a COVID marketplace, you, you don't know who's going to have a better relationship. You want to always add value to the customer. So everybody on your team's got to be, right, related to, uh, sensitive to customer relationships and sales. Now, in reference to knowing your customers, right, you've got to, again, know who they are, know what their problems are, be an expert, you know, help be the person they go to to solve problems. Uh, you've got to be one of their trusted advisors. It's genuinely be an expert in your space, right? And you've got to know your customer. Nobody has time to, to try things out. The dollars are scarce. The risks are real. Uh, it's very challenging. So step up your game, you know, be an expert if you're going to play in the space and be a tremendous value to your customers. You have to know your customers. You, not, you have to know what they're dealing with and be a positive value for them. So that's one. And also be able to ask questions and qualify, right? I mean, you also, it's, it's, for you, the risks are high, right? Respect yourself, for you, your business does not have the time and the resources to just shoot for customer engagement. For me now, customer engagement is, is irrelevant. I don't care if a customer is engaging because everybody's sitting at home and ready to get on the next Zoom call. And everybody would be love to hear what you're doing, but do they have a budget? And I want you to get tough enough to ask those kind of questions. Respect yourself, respect the pressures. You are under tremendous stress. So yeah, be kind and you know, be professional, but my gosh, qualify, right? You might want to rethink your ad campaigns and the keywords, what's really converting? Are you A-B testing? Redesign your marketing automation, find the right tool. I got a client right now that's just not even spending all the money on, on a CRM and just hyper-focusing on active campaign and uh, which is you know, our marketing automation tool and learning how to constantly ping because they're much more cost effective, ma automate the marketing, right? Because you want to rise to the top and help and automate the qualification and let this, the customer opt in, if you would, right? If you have salespeople or if you're a salesperson, you learn to ask tough questions and qualify these opportunities with your customers. It's very, very important. A lot of salespeople, you know, they used to take in orders. They don't know. I mean, the sales process, if you had one in 2019, I guarantee needs to be tweaked to sell in 2020. Guarantee. In the marketplace today, it's very different, right? You got to focus on people that have a budget. If you've got to figure out what those budgets are, maybe you do have to change your services and, and operate at 40% at a 40% discount. And you got to figure out how do I do that with my business? And how do I partner with customers? I'm doing it right now with a client that has less money than what, you know, uh, than what my, my budgets in 2019 would have allowed. So I negotiated a deal where I came in with less money, but I'm getting a bigger piece of the back end. Not doing it for free, but I'm getting a re restructuring the offer. You might have to do that too. Might have to, but you gotta figure out how are you gonna get cash, get a check, get a wire transfer from your customers, right? got to pros uh, prioritize on prospects that are going to do business with you now, right? Not if it's in the future, then treat them in the future. There's a different way. you got to prioritize, right? Uh, and we talked about this earlier. Everybody's in the sales, but I want you to understand one thing here, this, this uh, point on, on top right. 
your customer is having only one single unique experience, right? Uh, I used to stay at Marriott's when I used to fly around and do, you know, for years, only Marriott's. And I used to rent uh, only Avis cars, as an example. I only had one relation. In my mind, it was just Marriott, irrespective of everywhere I went. But I started noticing there were trends in corporate culture. And I liked the Marriott experience. They did a good job training people. Same thing with Starbucks, you know, in the early, early, early days, uh, you know, I, had, I was on a point of trying to, you know, I used to, I used to drink a double, double shot espresso uh, in, I think it was called a, a latte, a small double latte or something like that. But my point is, it was consistent from New York to Charlotte, Chicago, to Chicago, to the turnpike uh, on uh, exit four, right, in New Jersey, to Philadelphia, everywhere. They nailed it in terms of consistency. Your customer's having one experience with you. So you make sure that everybody on your team is having a consistent uh, relationship of trust, right? With your, with, your, with your customers. Again, I keep bringing this up, trying to repeat it a few times. Revenue is fundamental, right? It's fundamental to your business. Now you've got to learn to do it profitably, but everybody, what marketing does, pre-sales, sales, customer support, new product development, all that needs to come together in an efficient way, in a COVID market sensitive way to produce revenue, right? Especially if you want it to be profitable. Sorry about that. Okay, I hope you're taking writing questions down because uh, we'll definitely have Q&A. This is very practical stuff. I do want to take, uh, take your questions, right? Uh, we still have a few minutes, about 10 more minutes of this, and then we'll break into questions. All right. So if you're pivoting, right, if you're tweaking what you're doing, the big buckets, right, to get to revenue in today's market. One is you've got to have market fit. Do people need what you have to offer today in a COVID marketplace? And are they willing to pay for it? That's the fit, right? Your offer narrative. Are you compelling, right? seductive in your offer, right? Your marketing strategy, are you findable? Are people gonna, the right folks with the budget finding you or you finding them, right? Is that, is that happening? Again, people with budget, not just interest. And your sales process, right? Have you figured out a way how to qualify people against time and budget quickly? And customer engagement, right? I mean, the, the, the fundamentals of a repeat customer is much more profitable than a new customer. Are you engaging your customers in a way that they want to engage? Because now engagement can't be come to the store. It can't be come to the club. It can't be, you know, what have you. Come to the restaurant. Come to the office. No, you've got to do it online. And can you extend your value online? Right? Are you delivering value? Because Again, you, you want to shoot for not just the first transaction, but the 25th transaction, right? And beyond. There are some inconvenient truths, right? As I talked about this earlier. There are no more sales cycles, guys. There's only buying cycles. Your customers are buying. If they're not buying, you don't have game. So is your sales process linked and in sync with their buying cycle? This is key, right? If here's another one, if you're not in revenue, you're still in fantasy. I work a lot with startups and I teach at the Founder Institute and people are coming up with their strategies, the thing they're, they're in business, but they don't have strat the revenue yet. They've got plans, but no revenue. And I say this to make a point. And the point is what you sold in 2019 may or may not be relevant or able or, you know, a possibility in 2020. Uh, we had a question earlier about somebody in the chocolate business and wanting to sell B2B stores, right? Uh, you've got to learn to get, this is, this is for you, right? So you've got to learn to understand for your stores, how are they selling? They are not, they, this is the B2B2C strategy I was talking about, right? They are not yet, they don't have customers coming to the stores as much as they did before, but they do have 
a customer list, they do have relationships because they, that's their business to get product to their customers and they may be trying different things, right? You've got to tap into that. You've got to say, hey, I will help you deliver, you sell your product to your customer online. So maybe you make them an offer and say, they can market your product on their website or in an email blast or what have you, and you drop ship the product. Right? You've got to get creative. You've got to find ways to that. You should not be selling your, hey, I've got chocolate, but you've got, you've got to get, say something like, I would say something like, I've got a way for you to increase transaction value for your customers with a little sweetness and goodness with this chocolate. It's unique. It's different. But I want to get creative. I want to, let's have a conversation about figuring, me helping you fulfill and complete more transactions. And maybe let's get creative on the supply chain. Let's get creative on the drop shipping right? You've got to figure out all the different pieces that have to go into place for the transaction to get complete, right? And for them, they are stores, grocery stores, convenience stores, gift stores, you know, things like that, uh, that are suffering and looking for, uh, for ways to make more money and complete more transactions. And if you can have that conversation using chocolate, boom, you might have a sale, right? I hope that helps. And obviously we can, you know, Please connect with me later and we can d drill down a little deeper. But this strategy I'm talking to you about actually is a friend of mine who's got um, dog treats, right? Um, uh, what's his name? Wolfdaddy.dog, I believe. So he's got his treats. He's an individual. And he's going to front, front Porch Pets, I believe it's called, that has 3,100 outlets. And they're dropping this one person's streets into their mix of product and selling to their channel, right? So it's working, uh, you, but you've got to find those angles. Again, it's all personal. You got to figure out who, who's interested in, in what you have and how can you help their business? It's got to be reciprocal. All right, um, all sustainable business, all sustainable business, right? Is based on lasting relationships. I mean, uh, Hathaway, right? And uh, Warren Buffett has anchored his entire career on that, right? He doesn't buy and sell, buy and sell. He buys and holds. You do the same thing. You go to the same set of restaurants. You go to the same coffee shops. You go to the same, you know, if you're Apple, you're Apple. Uh, if you buy Ford, you buy Ford. You don't buy Ford and then Chevy, right? It's, you will notice this. It's, 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 it's fundamental. People want to, once they it's all sales, all business is personal and it's emotional. Once you have an emotional, a customer has an emotional connection with your brand. This is why I asked you right up front. What's your brand? How are your customers relating to you and how are you supporting that? Who you are really matters, right? People are dropping, you know, somebody does something um, uh, politically incorrect and you've seen that all recently and people just switch their brands. They bike out their brands. This is real, right? And in today's world, it's not just about cool tech anymore. It's the shiny objects. We, we don't have time for shiny objects. Nobody's buying escalades on, you know, equity in their homes. Uh, it's about solving funded problems, right? So you've got to really find out, hey, you know what? It's not just what problems you have, but what funded problems you have. And if you're going to del deliver a solution, it's got to be sustainable. There's no wiggle room here. You won't get a second chance. Why? Because we live in a connected uh, society. This is really important for you to understand, right? You've got to tap into the viralness of your customer base. You've got to tap in everybody. Everybody's a publisher now, right? Everybody's producing and consuming content that they care about, right? Are you tapping into that? It's not a problem. It's not a problem, guys. Right? It's a way for you to engage. It's more opportunities for you to engage very, very cost-effectively with many people in the channel. Just build the channel, right? So think about that. You've got to be a master of the, in the social media game. You've got to be a master on the online game. It's very, very, very important. That's real estate. It's like trying to get a fashion brand, your store on Fifth Avenue in New York City. That's what social media is. It's our, you know, um, uh, Fifth Avenue. Again, are you solving problems that matter today in this COVID marketplace, guys? You want to increase revenue? You don't have any other option. You've only, your only playing field, the pitch, 
where the rubble meets the road. I keep repeating, this is part of my repetition here, so you get it, right? Your only pitch is that space of possibility, the possibility to act, is if you are giving people a solution to a problem they are willing to solve today in this market with money they have today. They might beg, borrow, steal, use stimulus money, what have you, but if they commit to, I got to solve this problem. Like, you know, I got out of San Jose and I came to New Mexico. I couldn't get this ranch funded, and I, but I got it by the banks and I got it funded in private money. Boom. I was committed, co closed the deal, made a transaction, made it happen. My point is you have to morph yourself and your business to make that happen for you. And right? this is the art of the pivot. This is how you're going to get a revenue. Don't try to squeeze you know, a round peg into a square hole. It's not going to work. Last year was last year. This year is this year. Very different places, very different markets, very different rules of engagement, very different uh, assessments of value. Think about that. Assessments of value. Your customers are making very different assessments of value. And I want you to be able to tap into that and find a way to close and make profitable deals, right? Here's a logistics company, one of my clients. They've got all the table stakes, warehousing, pick and packing, shipping, returns, inventory management, yada, 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 EDI, application integration, all that's done. But where they excel, they saw the writing on the wall. They saw the China wars happening. They saw USMCA, which is United States, Mexico, Canada agreement, the new NAFTA deal. They saw this huge movement of manufacturing and they said, you know, let's create jobs in America. Let's protect our customers' IP, intellectual property. And what they did is they started building right there in the Silicon Valley, started building like a manufacturing, but not full-blown manufacturing, assembly. So now they bring in parts from China and they assemble them for their hardware companies, clients in the Silicon Valley. Very powerful, very relevant. Mm -hmm. Right, not full blown manufacturing, but it is so important. They want to protect their customers. Right, China's a dangerous place. It's very costly to do business. Shipping is very costly. So they said, no, no, no. Don't bring big boxes of already made product. Bring small boxes of of, of components and chips and things like that. So even the shipping is much smaller, easier to bring, cost effective. Protect the IP so nobody has the full product. You know, the chips are made come in one place. The circuit boards another place or what have you. They assemble them in a secure environment and they ship very quickly within the US and the customers just love it because it's reduced a tremendous amount of risk in these challenging times. Like shipping, right? I do a lot of work. It's very costly to bring product in from China now in the COVID marketplace, right? And from anywhere in the world to give you real numbers. Last year it was $3.50 plus or minus to air freight a kilo from Hong Kong. Right now it's $8.40 plus or minus, right? almost three times the cost. Where's that money coming from? From your bottom line. That's how tough it is. So anything, you, there's so many creative ways we have to change to, to close deals, to, to pr provide value to our customers, but in a way that everybody benefits and you, you're, you're dropping costs and learning to make some money, but also protecting your customers. Be the expert. That's how I'm closing deals because I'm showing customers for my logistics companies who are my clients how they can take care of their customer by dropping cost and risk in these challenging times. All right, this is a big list, right? And we're almost done. So um, I'll go through this quickly. Uh, do you have market fit? Has your, has your customer base changed? Very important. Is your go-to-market strategies, right? Relevant for today's market. Has your sales process? morphed? Does it need to be redesigned? Do your salespeople need to be trained? Do you have the right people on board? Are you using the right sales tech so that your customers can transact online? That's you, you want to get the technology. So one, if your employees are remote, they have access to the data. Since your customers are remote, they have access to the information they need to complete a transaction for you. And then you have the technical ability to allow the, the customers to transact and then have a long-term relationship with you. It's all in the technology, right? So you've got, it's a really, we are in a very tech strong space right now. And if you don't have good tech, 
however small or however big you are, you're dead, right? You can't grow easily. Then obviously data security comes in, information access comes in, customer support comes in. And I think pricing is so important today. The assessment of value, nobody's talking about this. The assessment of value that your customers are making has totally changed. They are not willing to pay the same amount of money they did for the same product or service what they did last year. How is that impacting your business? You've got to think about that. All right? All right. Fundamental sales process. Again, and I hope, please come back and watch this video again. Uh, the, the slides should be up somewhere. But these steps are very relevant, right? You've got to build rapport, then build trust, uh, do problem identification, design a solution, work with them collaboratively, work with your sales, your prospects collaboratively so it becomes their solution. Then present to them their solution that they'd help you design. Your negotiation will be nothing, right? And you can close. And here's sort of a breakdown. Build trust and rapport, that's 40, 45%. 50% of your time should be just collaborating with them, learning about their problems, solving the problems with them, letting them get involved. And then the presenting a negotiation is simple because it's their idea. I, negotiation, it's, it's a done deal, right? This is the collaborative way to sell. I call it the opt-in close, right? Build trust and collaborate. So your customers in today's marketplace will tell you, no, we can't spend that much. We're only going to spend so much. Let's only take this feature, not that benefit. And, and let's do phase one, phase two, phase three, and, and show value. They'll allow them to specify that buying cycle that they're committed to, right? Because it's their money, and they've, they've got their own mental assessments of how they're going to spend that money. Again, technology is your friend. You've got to find ways to use technology. This is one company, they've pivoted beautifully, 23-year-old company out of Sri Lanka. But the guys are sitting in LA, the, the leaders. Uh, they have produced amazing software, commercial grade software, but now they're helping companies like you, right? Thrive in today's marketplace. Uh, but if you, you know, you, we've got a lot of people saying, hey, we got I gotta let my team go because our budgets were cut. Well, you can get now two or three more people with you know, one-tenth the cost in Sri Lanka. You're helping with data security, application integration, process automation, morphed, morphed, morphed. They used to just build custom software in the old days. They're rocking it out, right? Technology is your friend. Your tech stack, whatever technology you use has got to be able to create transactions, right? Forget about the old engagements of conversion rate and pages per session, clicks, you know, net promoter scores. Important, but not as important as a transaction. Get to a transaction. Take care of yourself. I really care about who you are, right? Are you functioning at peak performance? Your business is as only good, it'll only perform to the degree you can perform. If you're going through a tough time, you can't sell that day. Please, please, please take care of yourself. And if I can help in any way, please come. I've got a slide here about me on the healing ranch. You know, I, I do coaching and, 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 and all that just creating, creating a beautiful space for people to come together and be who they really need to be and heal their wounds and their pain and their suffering. You can find me on my website, paulusuza.com or specifically CROAAS is my services page as a chief revenue officer as a service. I also have a pod podcast, it's called Keeping It Real in Business and Life. And you can Google that and find it on iTunes. Uh, but it's actually originally hosted on SoundCloud. It's a SoundCloud slash um, Paul D'Souza. And uh, a lot of what I do is anchored in a philosophy. Uh, you can get to that at wado.org. It uh, means the way of harmony. But basically, it's a strategy that, that aligns with your purpose, takes care of the money, figures out the process, taps into people, and then helps those people fulfill their dreams. Uh, I'm now living on a healing ranch, and you're invited when we can travel again. This is where business leaders come. We take care of themselves individually and then work on their business strategy. And when I'm not doing calls like this, I'm rescuing wild Mustang horses and teaching them how to play polo in time, but just rescuing them. Otherwise, they'd have been sent to the slaughterhouse uh, and I'm rescuing them from the Navajo Nation. Anyway, that's it for me. Uh, I look forward to working with you. And uh, Maria, I, I apologize. I might've gone a few minutes past, uh, but I think you had questions and answers now. 
Yes, Paul. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for sharing about yourself personally and also sharing this revenue overview and some really excellent tactical strategies. So for everyone here, uh, first and foremost, thank you again for being with us today. We would love, love, love to host your questions live. So some of you have participated already in chat, sending me direct messages and or put your questions in the Q&A, continue to do that. And we have a few more minutes, maybe 10 minutes or so in which Paul can answer these questions. So before we begin, I'll ask one gentle uh, request. We love putting on this free programming. Paul is an incredible expert in his um, ability to share and the wisdom that he holds about all things business. The only way that we know how to bring in experts like this is if you tell us. So if you can take a few minutes as we are going through Q&A, fill out the survey that is posted uh, by our webinar host here in the chat while you are listening. Um, it takes two and a half minutes timed. We would love to hear from you. Okay, Paul, are you ready to answer some questions? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Amazing. Oh, by the way, I just realized I didn't talk about my book. Oh, please do. take a moment. <laughs> Do you want to take a moment, take one minute and talk about your book, please? And yeah, also, Paul, guys. what you might want to do, maybe stop sharing your screen so we could see the full image of you. Oh, I see. Okay. Perfect. All right. There we go. Go ahead. All right. So, you hope, yeah, guys, I wrote this book many, many years ago, but it's fundamental, right? I wrote it in 2008 and nine when we went through that market dip. And it's, you know, it's come back again. The only thing I would add to this is the, the power or the, the role that technology has in our lives, right? But it's a very good book on going back to the fundamentals of sales. So if you, if you uh, uh, want to go back again and for your team, and when, when I launched this book and I uh, published it last time, I had uh, people buy 2,000 copies for the whole, all their sales teams and we, I went and trained them. It's got, artic it's got exercises at, at the back of every chapter. It's got a practical exercise, so uh, it's a good read, and it's anchored in the philosophy I talked about, starting with purpose to practical leadership. So anyway, uh, if you will figure out a way, you can send me a note from my website, and I'll send you uh, for a small fee a, for shipping and stuff for that, a uh, signed copy. What a generous offer. Amazing. <laughs> so everyone also, you'll have Paul's information in the follow-up email as well as the slide deck and a replay of this specific webinar. So um, please take Paul up on his offer. And Paul, are you ready? Can we get a few questions in before we have to sign off today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So by the way, I'm looking at two questions over here. Should I go ahead and answer them? Oh, the please. Chat, the yes, two from Lauren. Please answer those. I would love for you to. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, Lauren. Um, this is the, the, the first thing about McDonald's. It's been listed out. Uh, it's been defined very clearly in the movie uh, on, uh, on the history of McDonald's and how it was started. I forget the, what the title of the movie is. Um, but basically, the, the, you know, McDonald's, they were trying to make burgers fast and they loved the, the process. Uh, and then they, they found an accountant that came and said, you're making burgers, but you're losing money. But did you realize that uh, you really, if you started owning your restaurants, you could actually start uh, making money in the real estate. And as real estate prices go up, your, your corporate value goes up because they were having the franchisees lease the buildings on their own dime. Uh, and they were just making burgers, making money on the burgers. So when that switch happened, uh, McDonald's became the giant it was because what they did is they started leveraging the money and use burgers just to pay the real estate bills. Uh, so that's that. And, and sales cycle versus buying cycle is very simple. Without a customer having a budget and being clear about that, committed to completing a sale, com completing a purchase rather, you don't have a sale. So your sales cycle, if you thought you had one, becomes absolutely irrelevant, all right? it has to map to and match whatever process your customer is buying. Uh, I've lost deals because a customer said, we've got to spend, you know, millions of dollars on the software and I clear case and their chairman of the board had a relationship with somebody they knew with my competitor and their buying cycle was like, we'll go with the people we know done. It had nothing to do with a better service, a better offer as an example. 
right? So my sales cycle was irrelevant. So the question is, you've got to sort of, that's why you trust and rapport and asking questions and getting into the psyche of your customer is very important. Understand what their buying cycle is, understand what's important to them, who are the decision makers, and then map your sales process to match to their buying cycle. So well answered, Paul, thank you. Lauren, let us know if that answers your questions in the chat, or if you need further clarification, uh, please ask another question in the chat or the Q&A, and we're so grateful. So for everyone still here, let us know. Lauren says, perfect, thank you. Amazing, Lauren, thank you so much. Um, continue to post your questions in the chat, either direct message to me or in the Q&A. We are really excited. We have about six more minutes to answer some questions. So Paul, here's a question for you from our audience. What is your opinion about using influencers during a sales process? Is it possible to use influencers? I think this means influencers via social media. What is your opinion about using influencers? Oh. It's a fantastic way to doing it. One of my clients right now in the apparel business, absolutely. Every time they've got a new piece of fashion going out, uh, they, uh, they've got a bunch of influencers. They're still young as a company. They're very small, uh, growing rapidly, almost 50% every month. Uh, but still, you know, they can't use the high pressure, the, the high value influencers. You could, they are finding people with less number of followers and things like that. They're sending them clothes, they're putting them on, taking photographs and talking to their audience and sales are going up. Absolutely. I was doing this many, many years ago when I sold 3D animation uh, um, processing. Uh, we sold uh, training for uh, uh, UAVs and things like that, the Patriot missile training. And we hired retired generals because uh, they had relationships with people in the military to, to buy our 3D animation training. So influencers is absolutely a way to grow your business, but you got to work the economics. The economics, you know, some people are too costly. So you got to find the right people and you could have a, 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 a strategy where you grow and you use a different level or quality of influencer at different times at different inflection points when you can afford them. Oh, some great advice, Paul. Thank you so much. I especially love the mention of a kind of a tiered system. Um, when it comes to deciding yeah. who influencers you might engage with. You, you've got to be practical, right? You've got to be practical and, and, and honor your space where you are. I mean, it, like it sucks. Like, oh, I can't afford this guy. It'd be so great to have, you know, JLo would be influencing my, my, my fashion or what have you. But hey, it's okay. Start where you're at. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, there's always another bus. There's always tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Oh, I love that. Well, we have a question from Ron. Have you seen or can you give examples of a B2B company that has added on a B2C strategy that has been ex um, that has been successful? And can you explain maybe how a B2B company might do this? B2B to B2C. So I've got actually product companies uh, that I've, I've helped, you know, uh, bring in products, startup companies where they initially went only to distributors. They went B2B and they, they tapped in uh, but once they got successful, they, and they've got, they, because it's for them, it was really where the relationships were, right? Uh, and once they, they did that, they went, they actually got, I've got a company now, I believe it's uh, Buffalo Grid, did that to a certain extent, where they had a bigger product and they went only through commercial outlets. Uh, now what they're doing is they've got a smaller product, they've taken their core technology, brought it to a smaller product, and they're bringing in, going directly to on Kickstarter and going B2C. Fantastic, Paul. Thank you so much. So Ron, let us know if you have a clarifying question or if that answered your question, we would yeah. love to get back to you. If, if Ron has a question, can give me some detail about the, the industry, I might have more specifics. Wonderful. Great ask, Paul. So Ron, you heard your ask. Let us know in the chat. Oh, maybe he responded. Let's see. We'll give him a few minutes to respond. Um, so they so on something they need, inventory accounting system. All right. Great question. Uh, from Philly. from Philly. So let's so, read the question out, Paul, just because we have a lot of people on Facebook Live that are listening as well. Oh, so, wonderful. Yeah. So the question is, how do you sell them, the customer on something they need in, in, in paragraph uh, inventory accounting system? So the, it's a good question. It's, it's a standard B2B problem that people have. Uh, you're very clear that you've got a good inventory accounting system. You hear through the grapevine that the inventory accounting system of your prospect 
is not good because the employees don't like it. It does, they're using an older system and yours are so much better. Yes, but that is irrelevant. So your sales process has got to start going after the uh, business leaders in your prospect company and finding out if they have budgeted, they've identified changing their accounting system as a strategic initiative, right? Uh, and if they did, what are the timelines to do that? We all live with problems, right? Some people, I want to get hair, you know, some people want to lose weight, but we just live with it. Life goes on. Businesses do the same thing. They've got a million things that could, they could spend money on, but somewhere higher up, they make a decision. We're going to spend money only on these top three things, the top five things. And your job as a salesperson is to stop selling the value of your accounting system today right off the bat. But first, ask the questions about when will they have a strategic initiative that says, let's address our accounting system. And your question, your sales process, your education-based, and I would recommend to you an education-based marketing campaign. Read about that, right? Uh, an education-based marketing campaign to that executive suite, to the CFO and other people like that, to the CEO who, who say, hey, if you had a better accounting system, like ours, you could get X, Y, Z. And let's show you all the different tools and graphs and this and that and triggers and, you know, and uh, messages you can get to preempt and, and proactively solve. You know, you might get insight on, 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 um, on data based on what's going on, on so you can make business decisions and your accounting system can do all that because it's got a business intelligence piece and all that stuff. But you have to go there first and make sure that they decide, hey, Accounting is important for us today. And this applies to anybody who's trying to sell something today. You've got to make sure the first, before you launch into your offering, that there's a need and you can actually influence that. You can influence them saying, you know what? You're right. We, we should maybe prioritize accounting and make it happen in the next 90 days versus you know something we didn't even think about. So focus your sales strategy into influencing and educating your future customers. Paul, thank you so much for that answer. Philly says, great advice in the chat. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think we're just about at time, Paul. We might have a few additional questions, but we possibly might be able to answer those in the resource follow-up email. So Paul, okay. to close us out, what parting words might you want to share with our audience? Oh, listen, for me, I want to take care of you, right? You, the individual, you, the entrepreneur you the business owner. First, take care of yourself. So in today's world, be very grounded about who you are and what's important to you first, and then make sure your business can be a vehicle to give you that. If you're a salesperson, you're a business leader in somebody's business, make sure right, you're good at what you do, you love what you're doing, and that your business can take care of yourself and your family first. If that had, doesn't happen, there won't be integrity. You'll be out of integrity and you won't last to celebrate the sale. Paul, thank you so much. So on behalf of everyone here in attendance and behalf of NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, we are so grateful for your overview, for your wisdom and your insights. And to everyone that is still listening, again, thank Paul in the chat if you'd like to and or thank NASDAQ Center and Paul by filling out our survey. We would love to hear from you. Um, again, we would love to invite Paul back. Let us know different topics that either he or other ex experts might be able to speak to so that we can continue to offer programming like this. And Paul, so thank you very much for being with us today. Oh, you're most welcome. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. We're so happy to have you with us. And again, for all of you still with us, join us for our next events after the U.S. holiday, Tuesday, December 1st, Scaling, Building an Advisory Board, and Entering the Boardroom Like a Pro with Ryan Patel of CNN, and Wednesday, December 2nd, Mastering the Pivot with Sergio Marrero. Thank you all again for joining us. We'll see you very soon.